Okay, good morning. <laughs> I'm David Garvin, and I want to add my welcome to the welcome you just received from Aaron and from President Faust. We're absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, we have, hopefully, three distinguished panelists. <laughs> um, missing and soon to appear is Glenda Carpio, who is from English and African and African American Studies. Melissa Jackson, Melissa, sorry, Franklin. Franklin, Franklin. <laughs> Melissa yeah. Franklin from yeah. Physics and Larry Lessig from Law. And we've chosen a fairly provocative topic to kick off the session. Is there such a thing as educational innovation? Now you should take that in the spirit of deliberate provocation, but the idea is to raise as many questions as we raise answers. So before I turn to the panelists, I want to start with three observations. Two about innovation, one about education, each of which leads to a question. So the first, when we talk about innovation, we typically talk as if we're talking about something new, something not seen before. But the borderline between innovation and rediscovery is actually rather slim. Often what we're talking about when we talk about innovation is creative borrowing, borrowing from another field or another discipline. <clears throat> Let me give you two quick examples. The first is the case method. The business school loves to believe it invented the case method. <laughs> Not true. The law school actually invented the case method. Dean Langdell in 1870 first started to teach by what was then the Socratic method. The business school only adapted with a dean who was trained at Harvard Law School in the 1920s. And the medical school then adapted in the new pathway in 1985. Similarly with the flipped classroom. Flipped classroom sounds like an innovation. In fact, in tutorials and seminars, it's routinely used as the mode of education. So the question, the first motivating question here is, do we really need more educational innovation? Or do we actually need wider adoption and adaption of already established practices? So that's the first question to motivate the panel. Second, there is a very large literature in management and economics on innovation. And it has a disheartening finding. The single biggest cause of failure in innovations, routinely across the board, is technology in search of a market. Taking the latest cool new idea and pushing it out on users without getting a sense of their genuine needs and unmet demands. The question here for us is, to what extent do the latest wave of digital innovations in technology actually fall into this same trap? And then third, a shift to education. I'd suggest that many of the innovations that we're talking about have in fact been aimed at solving the same two persistent and perennial problems that have plagued education since the time of Socrates. And Aaron mentioned both of them, as did President Faust. The first is how to increase and maintain engagement. And there I would talk of engagement of both faculty and students, or faculty and learners. And second, how to minimize and overcome distance. Not just geographical distance, but the distance in mindsets in worldviews, across generations, between novice and expert. So again, the motivating question, are we really innovating, or are we simply stuck solving the same challenging, frustrating problems, engagement and distance? Now with that backdrop, I want to turn to the panelists. And let's start with three questions, which we'll take in turn. What for you is an educational innovation? Can you give us some concrete examples from your own experiences? 
And what do those examples suggest about your own priorities for educational practice? So Glenda, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, I would say I would take the first one, my priorities first, and then go backwards to address the questions that you proposed. Um, in my experiences teaching here at Harvard, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is to produce good citizens. Um, there is a way in which um, you know, there many of our students will become scholars um, or I think people can't hear me. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, some people will become scholars, many will go on to other fields, but no matter what, we need to make sure that we're producing good citizens. And so I think the question of uh, technology that you posed earlier, whether, you know, um, whether we need to just, you know, we need to uh, guard against using technology as a gadget, right, as a new fad. Um, I think in the question of how to produce good citizens suggests what needs do our students have um, to be savvy technology-wise, technology but also what needs do they have to go back to the more traditional questions about uh, te uh, teaching, right? So can they speak about difficult subjects? Uh, with people who don't agree with them, right? Can they speak with people who are from vastly different um, cultures, right? Or uh, can they speak other languages, right? Can they, are, how, how aware are they in the world, right? And so if we take up these questions that are kind of basic, right, and we ask what can technology do for that, then I think we're in a good path, right? So. The idea is also to, uh, always to say, um, what needs do we still have? If the needs are still the traditional questions of producing good citizens, so be it. But I don't think we should uh, say we need to either go back to the traditional or adopt new technologies. I think the question is both, right? It's like the need to produce good citizens should get us to think, how can innovation in technology help us form good citizens, right? So, so needs first. Absolutely. I think, you know, like you said, uh, technology in search of a market, it's the other way around, right? It's what needs can it f fill? And I think one of the needs that we, that we have here at Harvard is to produce better citizens, right? People who are not just out to create great careers, but that are out to actually understand um, how to be in the world, right? How to talk about Ferguson, how to talk about I I ISIS, right? In, a, in ways that are informed and um, knowledgeable about the world. Melissa? Uh, <clears throat> I really feel uncomfortable because I'm being asked to sit there and, it's, and you're being asked to sit there. This is one of our biggest problems, I think. Can you hear me? Really? Because I turned it off in case I said something. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's on. Hello? <laughs> higher. Higher. Higher, higher and higher. Maybe I should just, uh, hi. I'm a, I just want to tell you I'm an experimental physicist, and we don't usually have those experimental scientists here. Um, I'll come back to you. We have them only a few. I remember uh, about 10 years ago on the arts task force, there was one scientist out of 25 people. I learned a lot about innovation in that, uh, in that group of people and what not to do. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, innovation. First of all, in physics, we steal whatever we can from whoever we can. I, when, uh, when this man said that uh, someone at the law school invented the case method, I'm pretty sure there was a Russian who did it first. Uh, so we just steal as much as we can, but the question I have about innovation, and so I'm sure all the innovations have happened, and everybody will say, you know, ah, I did that 10 years ago, it didn't work, you know, that kind of thing. And so the biggest problem we have is we try all these things, we don't tell anybody it's all in our heads, and we don't communicate, and I think we should. But anyway, last year, I went back because I didn't know what to say, and I only had five minutes, now I only have two. And, uh, and I looked at the Hilt conference last year, and I saw this fantastic talk by a guy, Gilbert. And he was talking about how to transfer information in his head to information in the student's head. And I, said, and I thought to myself, get out of my head. Don't get anywhere near my head. 
And I thought, why am I having such a visceral reaction to him trying to put something in my head? Because in the future, you know, they're just going to have a machine. Every student is going to sit with a machine on their head. And they're not only going to say, is it in your head? They're going to say, is it in the right place? And I was thinking, get out of my head. The only thing I can do as a human, as a scientist, as anything, is to synthesize what you're saying in my way, make my own deep landscape, and don't bug me. That's me. So go away. So I just want to talk about that. I want to talk about what I've been doing in order to try and get the students to do their own synthesizing. It's something we don't do, because we say, take differential equations, and then take Newtonian mechanics, and then get an A, and then go to graduate school. But we never say, put all that stuff together and make sense of it. We show them a few professors who can do it, who, can, who have synthesized, and they go, wow, that's beautiful. But you don't want that professor to put that synthesis in your head. Get it out of my head. So I think this is my idea. What I'm trying to get the students to do is to think with their hands, with their heads, creatively. But it's really hard. Because the first thing you do is you say, what can I possibly do? I'm just a person in the physics department. You say, well, low-lying fruit. Okay, The lowest-lying fruit at Harvard are instructional laboratories. I haven't seen a professor in there in years. So you can do whatever you want in there. You can, I totally ripped out all the walls and changed everything. I mean, we did everything. And what we did is we got a team together and we said, we're going to make the best labs ever. And the team in making the labs learned a huge amount. We learned everything. We learned physics. And then we wrote it all down as a recipe and said, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then you will have learned something. And of course, they didn't learn anything. Well, not much. And then we said, OK, we learned something they didn't. Let's ask them. Let's ask them to ask the questions and answer them. And so now we have something called principles of scientific inquiry, where A, you can find the greatest experimental physicists of our time in the laboratory, in the instructional laboratory with the students. You will find in that laboratory Nothing nice, nothing fixed to the ground, everything movable, everything can be drilled into, everything can be broken. We don't paint the walls, we don't allow any nice things in there. Okay? And what's really interesting, and this sort of tells you something about our world, I know my world is very weird. Our, we've built something called the Cybox, we now have three of them. It's use, useful by everybody. In particular, drama groups come in there and give plays. And when the drama kids come in, they, they're over every inch of that space. They're putting lights everywhere. They're doing everything. They're moving everything. They have no respect. They have no respect, and they follow no rules. And that's what I want the physics students to do. The physics students come in, and they say, what should I do now? I can't move this table because it's probably not right. And I'm trying to teach them lack of respect. <laughs> I think I've probably talked for too long. But I have more to say. If you want to learn more about what we're doing in there, you can always come in and see us. Is that OK? Did I talk for too long? You were perfect. <laughs> yeah. Larry? <clears throat> A, a tough act to follow. And I will not try to follow it. I will try to lead from it. Um, so I like to think about the way in which technology is involved in this question of innovation, because at this stage of history, when we think of innovation, we think of technology. Um, and in the way I think about technology, I like to think about technology as architecture. Technology is, the, is creating the architecture within which we um, experience an incredibly large chunk of our life right now. And the question for educators, I think, is to ask whether the technology we're talking about is enhancing or inhibiting the architecture we need for education. So that presupposes one fact, which we might want to question, but let me just identify it. It presupposes we have a good sense of what the environment of so in my, so let's, let me just put one out there. I think an important part of education 
is to lead students into a place where they need to struggle with an idea. They need to struggle to understand it or to express their idea about it or to criticize it. Um, a little bit like exercise, not that I know anything about exercise, but a little bit like exercise, that you have to put yourself into a position where you're feeling something as you're, uh, as you're experiencing it. And um, architectures can help create the context for that, or they can inhibit uh, the experience of that kind of struggle. So when I first was at the Harvard Law School in the late 1990s, there was a question about whether to put Wi-Fi in the classrooms. And though I was here as the, as the professor teaching the law of cyberspace and the internet was everything I cared about, I was against Wi-Fi in the classrooms. And people said, well, why would you be against Wi-Fi in the classrooms? You're all for the internet. And I said, well, the same reason why I don't want to teach in a sports bar, right? <laughs> There's something profoundly disturbing about creating an environment, an architecture, within which people have a constant out, a constant opportunity to tune out from the difficult question you're trying to put right before them. Um, and and Wi-Fi is exactly that. It's a constant out. People are, as you know, as you teach them and you watch them surf to 4,000 different places instead of trying to figure out how to do a differential equation right at that moment. That's what you do? You do a differential equation? No, I don't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> um, and so then the response I got from my colleagues, or at least two of them, was hilarious. They said to me, well, you're being a paternalist. And I thought, yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm being a paternalist. I have a sense about how to structure the environment within which education can happen. Now, my colleague, um, Cass Sunstein, has a better term for paternalism. He calls it libertarian paternalism, um, by which he means you, you create the environment to enable people to achieve what they want to achieve. And the assumption I have about my students is that they want to learn something. And so I'm happy to be paternalistic about creating the environment within which I think they can learn something. Now, the thing to think about with technology is technology is not necessarily against creating that environment. Sometimes it helps create that environment. So the only way that I can write today is because of a technology called freedom. And freedom is a technology that I install on my computer. And whenever I want, I can tell it how long I don't want to be on the internet. So I type in three hours. And for three hours, I can't access the internet. And once I'm in that space where I can't access the internet, my mind is capable of writing. But if I'm not in that space, if I have the constant opportunity of the internet to say, here's a new email message, or geez, have you checked the Twitter feed? Or here, let's see what's the latest on Google News, I find I can't write. Now, it's not that I don't have the desire to write, and I might just be a weak person, right? I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing to submit that that's possible. But the point is, the technology here is enabling me by creating the environment, the architectural environment that I need in order to be able to do the hard thing that I find writing to be. Um, and so I think the thing we ought to be asking as we recognize the emergence of these technologies is to step back and just ask, what is it creating for the environment of education? Um, and that might allow us to interrogate what we think is good about that environment of education. But at least let's map how the technology helps or hinders that environment or that architectural context. So technology is both an enabler and a potential inhibitor of learning. Absolutely. So, so Glenn, let's come back to you. You, you have some examples. Sure. Of innovation in your own Well, way. you know, it occurs to me that sometimes students work out the hard problems that you're talking about through in the internet, right? Um, and so some, uh, one example that I wanted to give was that, you know, I was talking about citizenship. And one of the, and the needs that Harvard students have, one, one thing we need to pay attention to, and this um, I learned long ago, is to listen to what students need, right? Because um, if we come to them saying, you need X, Y, and C, okay, maybe we'll hit the mark. But I think often we need to put our heads down and hear what they have to, what they need. So one thing that I, 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 I learned from my students here um, while teaching a class on black humor, um, students really wanted to talk about race in class and gender and these things that are in some ways um, when, when they, um, you know, but they wanted to talk about them in an impolite way, right? Not in the general kind of, you know, the sort of almost really boring ways in which we can talk about these really important things, right? And so 
they wanted to talk about what used to be called, um, you know, what, what got denigrated as identity politics, right? And so I kept trying to say, this is not the space for it. This is the classroom, it's not the space for it, right? So, um, but I did encourage them to make something out of, out of that need. And some of my students created the um, I, I, I Too Am Harvard campaign, which was incredibly, um, had an incredible life on the internet, right? So they did a Tumblr, a Facebook page. They, one of the best things was that they created a play, which was based um, from, on a play that we had read in class. And they put it up. And they accessed all of the things that Harvard students are really good at accessing. So by the time that the play was put up, I was sitting next to a New York Times um, uh, critic, right? And so, and they called in the deans, and they, it, it, there was a part of it that was at, you know, sort of activist. So a, a lot of the, these students wanted to talk about things that are not just important for students of color. They're, it's, they're important for everyone that needs to be a good, seeks to be a good citizen, right? So they, the, the idea of, of I too am Harvard was to talk about what's called microaggressions, right? So when people um, go around, you know, sort of suffering the like very subtle forms of racism, sexism that occur in our society, and they wanted to talk about this in the classroom, and there was no space for it, right? So they created their own space for it, um, using uh, technologies that we try to dissuade them from in some ways, right? Like to be on Facebook, right? But all of a sudden, Facebook was the way in which they were trying to t uh, take this discussion about microaggressions to a broader form, right? i 2 m Harvard went viral, right? They, if you look at the way, w Wikipedia page of i 2 m Harvard, there's a whole list of i 2 um, put in uh, Oxford, right? Um, and a million other, uh, not a million, I'm exaggerating here, but a lot of other, um, colleges that started doing this campaign, right? And taking their own space through which they would be talking about difficult things that I think often we're too afraid to discuss with students because it gets to the realm of feeling and it, that seems to be anti-intellectual, but it's a real problem, right? If people, if students can't talk about their lives as human beings in a classroom, right? How do we, ex we expect them to actually be engaged in problems that are more abstract, right? Um, so I think for me, narrowing that gap between the student as a human being, right, a student as a feeling, sentient, soulful person, right, um, and a student who is also incredibly bright, um, how do we connect those two, right? Um, because for me, uh, it, whatever it takes to connect those two, I'm game with, right? Um, and uh, seeing students take, take um, innovation, tech, you know, the technological tools that are usually distractions, Right? and make, make something out of it seemed to me really important right? and uh, something that we should pay attention to. So if we listen to what we just heard from the panelists, that there are three themes that sound like they come through for all three. The first is when it comes to educational innovation, it should be driven by need, by students' need for having opportunities to learn. The second is that implicitly in what each of our three panelists said is there's the issue of space. Providing learners with sufficient space to engage with one another, to engage with the materials, and to reflect themselves. And the third, and here I want to shift ourselves a little bit, is implicitly while talking about innovation, each of our panelists has talked about change. Because an innovation is no more than the subset of the larger question of change. And each one of us in our educational innovations does something that involves a mini change process. Change in approach, a change in perspective, a change in values. Now, let's shift to the institutional level, because this really is a panel on institutional adaptation. Change is inherently difficult. Change is slow. And there's a very good reason for it. And, and here I want to quote one of the great authorities on education, the cartoon character Pogo. Pogo once said, most people prefer the certainty of misery 
to the misery of uncertainty. That, in a nutshell, is why change is so difficult. It's uncertain. We don't know what's going to come next. And the status quo has enormous power and sticking to it. Now, so what, what exactly would be a model or a framework for successful change as we think institutionally and we think about educational innovation? Now, a colleague of mine at the business school has what he calls the change formula. Before I give it to you, I need to issue a few caveats. Um, first, you should see this as fuzzy math. The mathematics don't quite add up. You should also see it has a liberal dose of business school speak. And you should assume it comes from somebody who has mathematical disabilities, <laughs> me. Or as my eldest daughter once explained to me, when she came home with a glittering report card, except for a low grade in math, and I asked her what happened, she said, look, Dad, there are three kinds of people in this world. Those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> so here's the formula. Let me give it to you. We'll go through the variables, and then we'll ask our panelists to reflect on how that applies to educational innovation at Harvard writ large. So the probability of successful change is a function of four variables. D, I'll define these in a minute, D times M times P has to be greater than C. So three positive driving forces, one negative or constraining force. What's D? D is dissatisfaction with the status quo. And at an institutional level, that means shared dissatisfaction. M is a model or models of the desired future particular instructional practices, different perspectives, learning by making or learning by constructing as opposed to learning by absorbing, and modeling behavior on the part of our institutional leaders and our faculty. P is the process of change. Change is not an event that occurs at a moment in time. It unfolds, as have the Hilt conferences. And those three variables, here's where the math gets a little fuzzy, somehow in combination have to be greater than C. The costs or perceived costs of change to participants. Loss of power, loss of identity, loss of self-esteem. Those are the felt losses, in a particular loss of skills. Somehow, institutionally, we have to get those three variables, D, M, and P, up, and we have to get C down. And in fact, when you heard our three panelists talk, implicitly they did that at the individual level with their own educational innovations. So let's now raise it to Harvard writ large. And Glenda, we'll start with you again. Based on your own experiences, coupled with the change formula as a rough guiding framework, what are the implications for educational change at Harvard? And in particular, what works, what doesn't work, what's necessary to do, and what are some paths forward? Well, one of the phrases that you used that really struck me was that uh, dissatisfaction <coughs> needs to be, if it's at the institutional level, it needs to be shared, right? So this is a problem, because I think in itself a problem, because a lot of uh, the satisfaction, how we gauge it, if we're going by the majority, right, that level of whatever we, we define as the satisfaction of the, at Harvard necessarily is going to leave out those who are the minority who see true dissatisfaction, right? And so I think that's a real challenge for us, um, particularly, for instance, if you go if, at the level of hiring uh, faculty that teach things differently at, uh, you know, the, uh, say in the Department of English, right? There's a great deal of fear for what people might do to the institution as it is, right? So I think one of the things, one of the challenges that we have as an institution is guarding what Harvard has meant, right? And so how do we go forward if the, if the main 
sort of knee-jerk reaction is to say, protect, right? Protect what we have. And while I agree that some measure of that has to be part of the formula, right? I think those who are most dissatisfied are always in the minority. And it's hard to create change at the institutional level if you are the one or the two faculty members in one large department that says, you know what, we, we need to have um, Asian American literature taught here. Not because you know, we want to go back to the 1970s, the field of ethnic studies has shifted tremendously in, across the 45 years since it's been um, instituted at universities, right? And yet universities like Harvard have a sense of fear that that is you know, these sort of fad ideas as I had to teach students, the idea that there is a kind of canon of literature that we need to protect, right? As if people working in ethnic studies haven't been understanding literature across 45 years in innovative ways, right? Um, we are, you know, we have a preeminent African American studies department, and the colleagues that I work with in that department are not thinking statically about African American studies, right? And yet, it took, you know, it it took a long, long time for Harvard to ad, ad, sort of understand itself as an institution that teaches these ethnic, other, racialized literatures, right? Um, I think the big challenge for us is to think how it's actually part of the big core of what we need to be teaching, right? And again, I don't think I sh this, these views are shared writ large in, at Harvard. So I think one of the questions, one of the challenges that we have to think about is how do we define dissatisfaction collectively? Okay. It's easier to do it individually. Individually, in small groups, right? Uh, the problem is, you know, I think if we look at even, you know, for instance, the collective power that women have at Harvard, right? I mean, that's different than other people, you know. You know, so like that is that's a question that we need to think about. Like, you know, the number of people who are tenured, uh, you know, think about it. Just, I mean, I don't want to go into the anecdotal, but I'm the first person of color to be tenured from within an English department. 2014, 2009, I was, I, I was, I was promoted, right? That's kind of crazy if you think about it, you know? So institutionally, that shouldn't really be, you know, my graduate students used to say that they were, when I was up for tenure, that they were going to have, um, yes, we can, but uh, pictures, uh, you know, posters with me in the pic in the poster, right? And that's that's really a, a kind of insane thing to think about at an institution that is as powerful as at the forefront, an institution that other people, other, that leads in terms of, ex by example, right? Um, so if that hasn't been part of the dissatisfaction at the majority level, I think that's a problem, right? Thank you. Melissa? Um, I was thinking about it in a little bit different way, institutional change. I, I did say that uh, I did say that you have to do it slowly and without asking. Um. Don't, don't ask permission. Ask forgiveness. Well, no, don't. Ever, don't even ask don't for ever forgiveness. Ask for you. Never say you're sorry. <laughs> but small things, you know, putting benches in the science center, make a huge difference. I know those are very small changes. A bigger change, so just changing the physical space or how we interact, how we are physically together is one thing you can do. But the thing, the bigger issue to me is for the professor to ask themselves, what am I doing here? What is being asked of me? What is being asked of me? So someone can say, teach this course in mechanics. And I say, OK, here's a book. I'll teach the book. And then it's the rule that after three years, you have to teach another course. So every innovation I make, everything I change, everything I do that's good or bad gets completely lost when the next person comes in. Because the next person thinks, hey, I have to give something of myself to this course. So nothing really ever gets better this way. Nothing gets better because the professor thinks they're supposed to give something of their own self to the course. So I think what we need to do instead is for each professor who gives something, we need some way of figuring out whether that something is useful and incorporating in the next time the next professor teaches. So the only way I've thought to do this, and it wasn't my idea, 
I don't know whose idea, probably some Russian, <laughs> <laughs> is to be able to write down the goals, the goals of what you're trying to do. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I don't mean goals on, like, I want to teach them mechanics. Goals at the level of each time you meet the students, what are the goals you want to come out of that? And to write those down and to be able to share those with other people. And because you're sharing just the goals and not how you, you know, get those goals, how you get, uh, how you, what's the, what's the word I'm looking Achieve. For? Achieve, yeah. Thank you. So sweet. Um, how you achieve those goals, it means the professor can feel that they're an individual and they do have a place and they're not obsolete. So that's very good. So this is the thing we've been trying to do in the physics department is to write down the goals of each course. And I can tell you that it is incredibly difficult. And what we've done is we've hired someone to come in and do it for us. So McKinsey's coming in. No. So, the, so but this is an incredible, our, our department is going to be the greatest department of all time because we are going to be able to write down these goals and the professors are going to be able to read them if they have enough Ritalin. And, and then we are going to be able to move slowly up by every person who does something good, instead of looking at them and saying, ugh, we're going to say, oh, and then we're going to use that. We're going to, we're going to do this, this thing, until eventually we won't need professors anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> let and me give you time, you. Larry, to think. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. If, if you reflect on what Glenda said, she emphasized the dissatisfaction and the need to get it shared. If you think about what Melissa said, she focused on the process and the various stages moving forward. Well, just, can I just say something? Your, your equation is dimensionally incorrect, so I refuse. <laughs> I, I refuse to have something on the left-hand side which doesn't have the same dimensions as the right-hand side. I mean, that's the only problem. Sorry. That, <laughs> that's the perils of having a scientist on this panel. <laughs> Larry. I am not a scientist, so feel comfortable now. Um, I think I, I want to first make sure we understand an ambiguity in the way that you're using the word change, right? Um, because sometimes, quote, change is about making things different, and sometimes, quote, change is about making things the same. So when I describe to you using the program Freedom to create an environment within which I am not distracted so that I can write, that's a change to recreate something that I think we remember there was a time before the internet we used to have, which was just the ability to sit down and write without you know, constant distraction. So those changes are a way to recreate the environment you've identified as a constructive educational or, produ or, or, or environment for producing work. Um, um, so that's the first point. And the second point is, you know, when you introduced our panel, you identified this truth that um, Typically, we have technologies in search of a, 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 of a solution, a, a problem. Um, that made it sound like these technologies were all optional, that we, in some sense, had the chance to reject them. And that is a good feeling, because most of these technologies we should reject. But I think we need to re recognize that there are certain non-optional technologies that we will find in our environment and can't escape. And part of the challenge is to craft education at the institutional level and also at the individual level around these things we can't escape. They become the default ways of interacting. And sometimes it's done in a really crazy way. There's an amazing little village in Italy that has turned all of its government service uh, into a Twitter feed. And everybody, including you know, police officers, have a badge number, but they also have their Twitter handle on their, on their badge. And basically, everybody is identified in Twitter, in, uh, on Twitter, and everything's done through Twitter. And the reason for this was the mayor kind of said, this is the default technology now. This is the way in which we are going to have to interact. And so they embraced it and interacted it. Um, and, and that sounds kind of harmless, but yesterday I was at a conference where Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, was describing the future of information technology. And at the last part of his talk, he said, you know, now the most important thing we're going to do is making people smarter, which sounds like a good idea. But then he said, the way we're going to be making people smarter 
is we're going to be constantly connecting everything in your brain to massive systems that are figuring out what the best possible thing is for you and for you to be doing at this one particular moment. Um, and constantly feeding this back and guiding you on the basis of what we know is the best possible thing for you to be doing at any particular moment. And I leaned over to the woman next to her and I, me and I said, what could possibly go wrong with this picture? <laughs> But, the, but the, point, the point is, if, you, if we begin to imagine a world in which people experience their relation to knowledge as just plugged into this system out there that in some sense is not optional, it's just the way the information environment is, then our job is to figure out how we educate given this non-optional technology that is now before us. Now, I hope... That's not the future in some deep sense. But what I'm saying is we, we have to recognize you know, a little bit of humility about the small power we've got to actually control what the future of this technology will look like and accept you can't spit in the wind of this change. You're going to have to figure out how to recreate the environment of, in, of education within the context of that uh, new technology. I agree completely. I mean, the, the issue is... is some technologies are now on the road to inevitably being the core technologies. The question is how we use them and whether we use them for the benefits of students' learning or we use them at, as a frill or a, a cost to student learning. So let me, let me take us one step further to action. And based on the discussion so far, and let me reverse the order. We'll do Larry, Melissa, and Glenda. Um, what would be your advice? And, and here we, I'd ask you for two pieces of advice. One, how would you advise a colleague thinking about educational innovation here at Harvard? And second, how would you advise an institutional leader thinking about educational innovation or educational change here at Harvard? Well, so the first advice, the, first, the answer to the first question would be to steal your idea, which came from a Russian, I understand. But, um, but, uh, but to say that, to, to start by, try, by being clear about what the objective of the unit is, whether the unit is a class or unit, is, I mean, a, a unit is a course or unit is a class, but what is the movement you're trying to achieve um, with the students? And to what extent is the environment helping you do that, the context, the architecture helping you do that? And to constantly reflect about that in a critical way, rather than just um, you know, accepting the reality as it, or the environment as it is and believing that there's nothing can be done about it. That, um, uh, that's, that's, that's the way I would approach it as the individual. At the institutional level, I guess I would, I, I would push hard to resist the tyranny of counting, um, right? So, Technology will enable the institution to count all sorts of things really efficiently, like the number of likes that students give to your class. Right? Um, we now, you know, it's going to be trivially easy every time you walked out of a lecture for students to say, I like that or I didn't like that, or I like this way of doing something or I don't like that way of doing something. And, uh, and then it's going to be very easy to aggregate and to rate and rank and allocate resources and incentives on the basis of all that counting. But um, there's no necessary connection between ease of counting and the production of education. Right? Uh, and so it'll be easy for the institution to say this is what we should be doing, but we need to resist that to the extent that ki that kind of counting isn't actually contributing to education. I think the best example of this, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is the kind of tyranny of counting in the British educational system for academics, where everything is a function of how many pages you produce that get published by journals, right? Um, so your whole scholarship is around this uh, uh, metric, which is about counting something, which is relatively easy to count. And, and you, you know, I think all of us have the sense which that, that can't be right. That can't be the best way to think about what's contributing to good scholarship. Or, but it's the easiest way to figure that out. It's an easy way to get real numbers and to decide how to allocate resources. And that's how they want to do it. And so I would say um, the objective at the institutional level is to resist the easy technologies of counting where you can't show that that counting is contributing to your understanding of what the education should be. 
Wow. <clears throat> I saw you wincing with the Google example because they really get in your head. <laughs> yeah. Get in my head. Um, so is the Freedom Program just turning off wireless? Or is there actually a program? <laughs> no, no. No, there actually is a program. Because if you turn off wireless, you yeah. can turn it on. But if the Freedom Program turns it off, and the only way to get back to it is to reboot your computer, which, of course, depending on your computer, can take one to four hours. Um. <laughs> really? You have a whole server? OK. Um, sorry, that was just a side. OK, I've, I've spent a, a bunch of time uh, trying to do innovations. And uh, I would like and, and have been somewhat successful mostly in making spaces. You, know, you go into the Science Center, and it's the most static place you've ever been. This is the Science Center. And every time you try and change something, there's somebody with a big you know, sign saying, you cannot change this. So I think if Rita Hauser was here, we would just say, let's blow it up. What we're doing is blowing it up from the inside, because the outside is nice. So I think one way for institutional change is just to really think about the space we're learning in and the, re the physical relation between professors and students and graduate students, the actual physical relationship and how we set it up. And I guess I keep doing that because I think there's, there's no other hope. Um, I think I think that Harvard is woefully understaffed and in assessment, assessment of what works and doesn't work. And in order to actually get serious about education, we're going to have to have a lot more emphasis on assessment. But you know, so far, we have the Q Guide, which is kind of like, it's like cavemen. You know? It's like cavemen, the likes. That's like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what cave women sound like. <laughs> actually, <laughs> cave women sound like those uh, fraternity parties. OK. so. Sorry, it's really hard to concentrate when there's so many people here I don't know looking at me. Um, but in order to do assessment, we need to have something to assess. And so we need the goals. I believe Harvard should all of a sudden scrap everything, forget technology, write down, try and come up with the goals, and then get people who know what they're doing to assess those goals. Is that happening? I, I ran the physics department for four years. We tried to, once in a while, we'd find a graduate student who wanted to assess something. But we really need to do it properly. Professors are not the right people, I can tell you right now. They're not professors of physics. So that's, a, that's an incredibly important thing we need to do. And we need to not do assessments that other people think are bullshit. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you know, like. That's a real problem, because professors are just like, someone gets up and says, yeah, we told these people what we wanted them to learn, and then we taught them something, and then we checked. And then we checked again 10 years later. And we just say, bullshit. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize for the word, but it's a technical word in physics. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so there's got to be a lot more trusting each other and being able to just call out bullshit out loud everywhere. So what we really need is a huge effort. And I mean, that's money. And I think, you know, look, Hilt is fantastic. You know what Hilt did, what he did for me personally? It said, you now can do what you wanted to do. And we're going to even give you money. You still don't have to ask anybody else. But we're going to give you, we're going to give you money to do it and go ahead and do it. That was fantastic. Now what we need is a huge push in serious goal making and assessment all across the university. And I don't see it happening. I don't think that's what is happening. And it's got to be way bigger than it is. And if we do that, I think we will actually, one, come together as a intellectual community much closer, because we will have things to share. And that would be really nice for me. I would know all of you already. And the other thing is, we would rock. Because our students wouldn't know a lot of stuff, but they would be amazing people who had synthesized their, everything we had said and are going to go off in the world and do amazing things. So that's my uh,
stump speech. Glenn? So can, we need more money, if anybody has. <laughs> OK, so you said, you know, what advice would you give to a colleague? What advice would you give to a leader in education, right? Um, and I think to a colleague, I would pass on a, a lesson that I learned. Um, I, I did the Teach for America program when I was in, in, in its infancy in Compton. And it was really hard. It was the hardest teaching job I've ever had. But the students there taught me that I need to teach by listening, by being really good at listening to my students. Right? And so through the years of teaching, I've also understood that there's a great pleasure. Because I think one of the things that I love about the classroom is that you learn a whole lot from your students. Right? And if you make that a priority of the way in which you think about what you want to give them, right? It's, it's a synergy that has an energy that's amazing, right? So to a colleague, I would say uh, to, to really be connected to students for what they have to teach you, right? In order to better gauge what it is that you have to teach them. Then I would say, too, that it's important to learn from each other, right? Just like being on this panel with people from different disciplines, it's already an interesting way to think about teaching, right? And so, you know, every so often, particularly one semester, I went to a colleague's lectures. I went to hear him lecture on books that I teach too. And that was really cool, you know, because I think, you know, he teaches, he has a really different way of teaching American literature. But I was primarily interested because he has such a different way of doing it, right? So to my colleague, I would say, you know, I mean, I think, the idea of thinking of built environments and how they influence how we connect as a community is really important. And I think, too, the fact that, you know, for me, most best teaching happens Socratically, right? So that you're in a conversation with your community, with your students, and with your fellow teachers. And I think, you know, this sounds really nice, right? It's hard, right? It's, really hard and that there are times in which it's difficult to, um, to gauge exactly what it is that you, your students need or what you can learn from other colleagues. But I think that's important. So that's what I would say to a colleague, right? Oh, uh, an, an, another, another professor. And to a, a leader, was it a leader in education? An institutional leader here at Harvard. An institutional leader here at Harvard. So a colleague of mine used to call the deans, the group of deans, the deanery, right? And it's so think about them as a kind of flock, right? And I think there's a great deal of distance at times between you know, the, the deans, the deanery, the, uh, the, and the professor at, in the classroom, right? And so what I would say is to think, again, to use resources for gauging um, how, to, how, to, how to clip some of that distance, right? So that there's a connection, too, between what administrators, love, uh, you know, people uh, you know, at, at the institutional level are thinking about how, what, what, you know, what does it mean to be in the classroom, right? And how does that influence what people are talking about at the university hall? I think the gap between the two is sometimes really wide, right? Um, it seems to be two different worlds. We're talking on, on the university hall level mostly about Resources, money, buildings, it's, it's, it you know, has the field of cor corporation. And you know, I'm no, I'm, I, despite the kind of touchy feely things I've said here, right, I'm, no, na I'm not naive. Right? This, we are a corporation, a huge, wonderful, big, wealthy, despite recent losses, corporation. And I think you know, there is a gap between what people do. You know, if I take up a wonderful novel by Nabokov, what I'm doing in the classroom is necessarily going to be different than what people are doing in a university hall thinking about resources. But I wonder if the gap needs to be that drastic. You know? And so I would, I would go, I would zero in on that. Okay, thank you. So let, let me quick summarize and then put us to work very briefly. So it, it, it's interesting that there's a common theme from these very disparate comments. One is often the solutions are decidedly low tech. Better listening, more engagement, closing the gap with other faculty. 
assessment, technology as an enabler. And second, we're back again to issues of engagement and issues of distance. Increasing the engagement, minimizing the distance. Now, in the last few minutes that are left, we do realize that there is an irony in having a panel presentation on a topic of engagement and distance. The irony has not been lost on us. You could easily be watching this on a screen. So what we want to do is remedy that now. So we're a large group, but we're conveniently divided into tables. So what we'd like to ask you to do is, with your table mates, caucus for a few minutes, and think about your response, a collective response, to a question I'll pose in just a moment. And the question will be in the very much the spirit of a comment by James Thurber, the great American humorist. It's better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. So we're going to frame it around questions. So what I'd like us to do is take a few minutes at your table and then think about what one question does this panel raise for you about improving teaching and learning at Harvard. You'll see a colored piece of paper at your table. If you could, once you've caucused, I'll call the group back to order, write out that question, have one of you be a scribe, on this colored piece of paper. We'll collect it and we'll show it during the lunch break so that we can continue that conversation. So clear? What one question does this panel raise for you about improving teaching and learning at Harvard? OK? Just talk amongst yourselves. We have about five minutes. OK. Before I turn this over to Aaron, I, I want to end with one final thought. And I searched long and hard to find one of Harvard's own to comment. And this is a quotation from Pre President Lowell. So it goes back a number of years. And he said, the great art in life lies less in solving problems than in finding the problems to be solved. I think it's as true of education as it is of this Hilt Conference. And hopefully, we've started a series of conversations around what are the challenges of problems we need to address going forward. So with that, I want to add my thanks to the panelists. Turn it over to Aaron.